All right, good morning. Uh, this is uh, Logic Design for the 12th, uh, Monday. And uh, I'm going to cover uh, Unit 10, which is kind of a brief introduction to the hardware description languages. Now, we've already, we've already touched on this. I covered some of this already uh, when I did KMAPS. So, um, so I'm going to go through it relatively quickly because there won't be a lot of new material. And then, um, and then what I want to do is, uh, is to just work the quiz uh, for the, the Queenie McCloskey quiz. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, so let's get on it. So I'm going to shrink this down. Let's see, I think first we'll bring this up. So there's the syllabus, and then let me shrink this down. Uh, so you can see the, uh, the syllabus. This is week uh, eight, hard to believe. So uh, today, uh, the uh, midterm grades are due, uh, and so uh, I will put those in. Up, what I'll probably do, if you're doing relatively well, uh, I'll give everybody a, probably an A or a B or something. Uh, it doesn't mean a whole lot at this point. And then, but if you're really struggling, I'll give you a C. So if you get a C, you know that you just have to pick up the pace. It doesn't mean you're going to get a C. Uh, in fact, uh, in this course. Uh, the vast majority of students get A's and B's, and uh, just a handful get C's, and uh, only one or two actually flunk, and usually those are ones who, uh, who skipped the final or, you know, some had some major problem with the course and uh, did very poorly all along. So not to worry, you're probably going to do great in this course. And again, uh, if you just keep up, I think most of you will do very well on the second test, which is uh, coming up. Uh, let's see, when is that? If we keep on looking here. Uh, oh yeah, we're gonna we're gonna try and do group presentations starting next week. Uh, so yeah, so this week we'll 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 finish all the way up through flip flops, and this will be all the material. So this week we'll finish the material that's going to be on the next test. And uh, the reason I like to do the presentations though is because if you finish your presentate your group projects, you will learn material that will be on the test, and that will be very helpful for you. So I, I think you'll find if you finish that up, it'll really, really help you. And, uh, and uh, again, you can come to uh, the Zoom time at noon today and, uh, and get help with your project if you need it. Okay, um, the office time, yeah. All right, so moving along. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, the uh, Unit 10, which is the introduction to VHDL. And so... Uh, VHDL can be used to do uh, to do complete, you know, very complex systems, uh, as can Verilog. And I'm going to talk about both VHDL and Verilog because in uh, this department we pretty much only use Verilog. Yes. So since we use Verilog in this department uh, quite a bit, and for like for DSD, of course I teach, we use it uh, for Dr. John's course, uh, Introduction to VLSI. He uses it in there. Uh, and we don't really use VHDL, but your, your textbook has VHDL, so I kind of do both. They're, they're still both the most commonly used hardware description languages, and they're very similar. The syntax is quite different, but everything else is very similar. Uh, so we'll talk about that. We're going to talk about uh, we, these hardware description languages can do very complex systems. In fact, um, your, the chip in your desktop or laptop it, almost assuredly was, was produced with uh, Verilog code. And so that's, that's an extremely powerful chip. I mean, it has a built-in math coprocessor. It it's, uh, has all this pipelining, multiple cores. I mean, it's very complicated. And, uh, and all that's done with these hardware description languages. So of course they can describe combinational circuits and sequential circuits, state machines, the whole nine yards. They're very powerful. Uh, so, but, but we're just going to, in this... Uh, in this introduction, in this course, you're just going to get a little taste of it. We'll, we'll give you a little feel for the combinational circuits today, and then later on at the end of the course, we'll talk about uh, how uh, the hardware description languages do uh, sequential design with always blocks and uh, and uh, and uh, other constructs. All right, so we'll talk about uh, how you can model a multiplexer, a four-bit adder. We'll we'll talk about some of the uh, some of the syntax for signals and constants arrays, operators, uh, packages, and libraries, and how it's an IEEE standard, and a little bit about how it's, how it's uh, synthesized, compiled, uh, simulated, and how it's synthesized. All right. 
So again, you've seen some of this. There is it, HDL just stands for Hardware Description Language, and uh, there are two main HDLs, VHDL and Verilog, and they they all have uh, they're basically set up to describe the behavior of electronic components. So they're not just programming languages. They're really a lot more than that. They also describe uh, timing delays and other features. And because of that, <clears throat> uh, you can you can model simple uh, simple sets of logic gates all way all the way to complete microprocessors and very complicated circuits. So we we can put in uh, we can put in uh, descriptions of rise times, fall times, gate delays, transport delays, uh, and all sorts of things so that we can actually simulate these circuits and see if they're going to work as we hope. That see if our timing uh, uh, targets have been met or if not. And those are very important things when you're going to, uh, say, build an actual um, uh, application-specific integrated circuit from scratch. Uh, when you do that, then you really want to make sure when you go to the foundry that your probability of success is very, very high because it's quite expensive to go back and fix uh, problems in your, in your, uh, in your foundry. Uh, and you may have a whole bunch of bad chips that you can't use that you spend a lot of money manufacturing. Uh, all right. <clears throat> so one of the real advantages of a hardware description language is that you can break your system down into modules. And you can then uh, sort out the problems in each of the individual modules. And then you can put them together into a very large and complex circuit uh, with some level of confidence that each individual module is going to work as advertised. Um, so this, this definitely helps uh, with, uh, deal with the incredible complexity. Uh, remember, that the, uh, remember that the latest NVIDIA chip uh, uh, has uh, something like uh, 2 billion or 4 billion transistors on it with a B billion. Hard to believe. I mean, just think about that. Uh, 2 billion transistors. And every one of them has to be wired up correctly. Uh, imagine that. Imagine a schematic with two billion transistors on it. I mean, imagine, for starters, just where you would unfold such a schematic, how you would even ever actually look at it, uh, and then how you could possibly make any sense out of it. Trace wires through billions and billions of transistors? Unbelievable. So the only way we can do this is to is to break it down into smaller parts and and work each of those individually and then and then build them up into a much more complex system. Uh, one of the things I'm sure that's true in this NVIDIA card that uh, that there are many identical circuits that are repeated many many times uh, because there are certain functionalities that uh, that are required and uh, obviously these cards get a lot of their power by doing in parallel uh, some of the uh, some of the operations. Uh, this, in fact, is uh, it really points to one of the salient uh, driving forces in the in the digital design world today. The more we can do things in parallel, the faster we can do them. Uh, we we are sort of at a limit in how fast we can step through things. Step one, step two, step three. I mean, there may be a little marginal gain on the edges, but but for all intents and purposes, we're we're down in uh, you know in our in our gate delays of just a few nanoseconds. Uh, we're we're really up against uh, basically the speed of the speed of light, so our our serial algorithms really are 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 bound by the limits of physics at this point. Now, uh, how do you get around that? Well, the, there's the, there the main way you get around that is by doing in parallel, uh, so that so that you have let's say you have to do uh, a thousand additions. If you had a thousand adders, you could do them all in just one step, right? If you if you only have one adder, then you have to do it in a thousand iterations of that adder. Clearly, that's a th that takes a thousand times longer, and that's that's the difference between a serial algorithm and a parallel algorithm. So, as much as we can, we want to convert our algorithms into parallel sort of parallel logic. Now, sometimes that's impossible. You need the results of step one before you can conclude step two, and. Uh, and so that does that does limit you. So then you need to go back and look at your over, your original thoughts about the problem you're solving, and if you might solve it in some different way that could be done implemented in a parallel manner. 
The other way that we can uh, that we can solve this is by uh, is by using uh, a quantum computer. And the, the the essential trick of a quantum computer is that it explores all possible solutions simultaneously. Again, essentially in parallel. Uh, so this is uh, <clears throat> so this is partly the power of a quantum computer. And <clears throat> or it's, it's pretty much all the power of the quantum computer. And once we get uh, once we get the ability to scale up from where we are now, so that we can have several hundred qubits, uh, we may see some some uh, some real benefits from quantum computing. Right now, it's still more of a curiosity. We're really in the dark ages of quantum computing. Um, most of the uh, devices that have been built are absolutely not scalable. Uh, so you 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 have 50 qubits, you cannot have 100 qubits uh, because you you can't. You can't jam uh, 50 more qubits in, into the into the mechanics of what's already been developed. Uh, it can't be done. So there are some major breakthroughs that are required. The other problem is uh, developing algorithms where our solutions. Uh, when you you the main thing about quantum computing is you have to uh, allow for quantum entanglement, and quantum entanglement is only possible when you have not interrogated the system and, and actually know the state of any of the qubits. As soon as you interrogate the system, this, the system collapses to a single solution. If it's the solution you're looking for, Eureka, you have scored, you, you have, you grabbed the golden ring. But getting that to happen uh, has become, uh, is a little bit uh, tricky and maybe even, maybe arguably, uh, we are still determining the degree which that's possible in an arbitrary problem. All right, so HDLs are uh, allow us to have these very complex systems. They have some very general purpose programming features to them, uh, just like C. And in fact, Verilog came straight from C. It, it has a lot of C uh, syntax. And uh, VHDL came straight from a programming language called Ada, which you're probably not familiar with. But Ada is used by uh, a lot of the major weapon systems uh, builders for missiles, airplanes, uh, tanks, and other weapon systems to uh, to design the software that goes in them, and uh, and VHDL came directly out of Ada. One of the things that we want in in almost every one of our designs is we want what's called a test bench, which is a, a <clears throat> which is some additional uh, hardware description language code that is created to exercise our our, our project uh, and and simulate it and see how it works and check the answers uh, provide the inputs check the outputs and see if it's doing what we expect all right um, we've covered this before there are we, we deal in levels of abstraction from the complicated to the simple and uh, our, our, I kind of said that backwards we we talk about high levels of description like s equals a plus B well notice we haven't said how many bits is involved here at all we haven't said what kind of gates, you know, AND gates, inverters, and OR gate, or whether we're going to use NANDs or NORs, or how we're going to set this up, or exclusive ORs, or lookup tables and multiplexers, or what we're going to do. Uh, we've just said we want A plus B equal to S. And uh, so this is an algorithmic level description. We call this behavioral level. And also in the behavioral level, we have like a data flow where we talk about, uh, now, we, now we're talking about, well, maybe how many bits wide these things are, and, and and where we're going to hold the results and things like that, but we're still not talking about specific gates. And then we get down into the structural level where we actually specify the components that we're going to use. Now, in the early days of HDLs, a lot of work was done at this structural level, but nowadays a lot of work is done at this very high behavioral level as much as we can, and we let the synthesizer do the work of converting our behavioral descriptions into the actual structural, structural descriptions and then into the actual uh, the actual tools that are needed to have a physical implementation. And the physical implementations really take two forms. One, well, I guess you could say three forms. One form is we program a field programmable gate array, an FPGA. The second form is we put the final step of, uh, of making an integrated circuit. It's already partially made. All uh, We have a whole bunch of, of uh, building blocks built into the chip, but they're not connected. And then we do the final mask where we connect everything up, and that final mask uh, is just a last step at the foundry. And so we do that last step, and boom, now we have an application-specific integrated circuit. And then the final way is we just design an integrated circuit 
uh, from scratch, from the ground up. So those are the, those are the three different forms. Of, of those three, they all have their different characteristics. Uh, the FPGA, is uh, they're expensive to buy, so in large quantities, you wouldn't want to go with FPGA. You'd want to do a uh, you'd want to do a uh, either the the uh, the application specific uh, integrated circuit, or you'd want to do the mask programmable uh, integrated circuit um, because that would be cheaper in in larger quantities. However, if you're just doing uh, you know a few hundred, or if you're prototyping things, then you definitely want to do the FPGA because that would be so much more uh, cost effective. But in the FPGA, you have, uh, you have some overhead that's tied up in the programming. So the thing that makes these chips programmable is also generates overhead and heat. So that causes problems. And it also throws in some unpredictability in, in timing. So if you have a very, very high speed chip you're working on, uh, you may not be able to get it done in FPGA. You may have to go to a dedicated, uh, unique integrated circuit in order to hit the timing goals that you have. So there are some constraints. Another constraint is if you want to get something to market quickly, uh, you probably can't develop a brand new chip and uh, f fabricate it in a foundry. For one thing, you may not own the foundry. You may have to uh, have time in the foundry, and so that you may have to be sequenced in a few months down the road. That could definitely cause delays in your project. So there are lots of considerations. So I want you to keep in mind three levels of, of description, behavioral, data flow, and structural. Now, just to be fair, getting clean divisions between these can be a little bit uh, tricky. They're not, they kind of flow into each other to some degree, but you can think of the behavioral as A plus B equals S. You can think of the data flow as, well, now we've defined how many bits wide these are. And you can think of structural. Now we've decided we're going to use uh, NOR gates or NAND gates or some specific uh, component to implement it. And also in data flow, that would also be where we'd make the decision between a ripple carry adder and maybe a carry look ahead or a carry propagate adder that would be a lot faster. Okay, there, these things evolved, and I think I've covered this slide before, from IEEE standards over time. Um, Verilog uh, also came from, again, C, evolved over time. It was originally owned by a company, and then they, when it uh, looked like VHDL was going to take over everything they uh, they made it an open standard and it became an IEEE standard uh, in the United States Verilog has kind of taken over uh, from VHDL I think for a lot of things um, but VHDL seems to be more popular in Europe um, uh, anyway uh, and yeah and then Cadence Design Systems acquired Verilog in 1985 so they're kind of the ones that that sort of pushed it along but I'd say at this point, Verilog probably is winning the battle. Um, the nice thing is, once you've done a design in one of these languages, you, you can reuse it, and you don't have to throw it away. Uh, the tools will just update, in, regardless of the language. The language doesn't change. Now, there have been a couple of updates in syntax and things like that and features. But uh, other than that, uh, and it's all backwards compatible, but the, the synthesis tools, they're upgraded all the time. And, uh, and so even when the language hasn't changed a bit, your synthesis tools may have changed a lot and uh, become much more powerful. It's a good way to share knowledge with other designers. And what's nice is, in many cases, if you're going to build a fairly complicated product, uh, you can buy several pieces of it that you don't even have to do yourself. Uh, like if, let's say you need to do some complex math, you can buy a, co a math coprocessor and just in integrate it. Um, this is also how today most microprocessors are made. They buy the core from ARM, which doesn't actually make any silicon at all. All they do are make Verilog and VHDL files. They, they license these files to the manufacturer, uh, who then throws in uh, their, their additional features, their modules, their data buses, and, and, uh, and all the other things. Uh, how they're going to integrate uh, the, the program memory and the data memory and special modules. And, and then they manufacture the chip using this uh, combined large uh, Verilog or VHDL file. Um, here's a simple circuit in VHDL. We've looked at this before. Uh, we can also look at it in Verilog, so we'll give you both. In the VHDL, we would write, we would write it on like this. C is A and B after 5 nanoseconds. So that specifies the propagation delay through this gate of 5 nanoseconds. And then E 
is C or D after 5 nanoseconds. So that's the syntax for VHDL, and here's the syntax for Verilog. We assign C, pound 5, that's the propagation delay, A anded with B, bitwise anded, because it's a single, a single ampersand, and here we have assign E, pound 5 equals C vertical bar D, that's C or with D. Again, same exact result, just different syntax. Uh, here is a three ways you can do a 2 to 1 mux in VHDL. So you can say F equals not A anded with I0 or A anded with I1. So again, your A is your control signal. So A prime and I0 or A and I1. So either A, I1 or I0 will be a pass through to F. And then here's a, an assignment statement. F equals I0 when A is 0 else I1. That's another way you can do it. Or you can do this cell statement. Now these are all Verilog. I'm sorry. Uh, these are all VHDL. Uh, we'll look at the Verilog in just a second. So select signal assignment. Uh, cell equals A. With cell select, F equals I0 when 0, I1 when 1. So that's another uh, selected signal assignment statement. So those are three different ways to do in VHDL the same uh, 2 to 1 multiplexer. All right. Here it is in Verilog. We've got a couple different ways we can do it. Uh, and I didn't even show you the always block, which is a third way. So there's several ways in both of these languages to do it. Uh, here you have the question colon construct, which you probably were exposed to in your C course, uh, or will be, but you may not have ever used it. it. It's actually a very powerful tool, but a lot of C programmers just never use it. Uh, and you put the signal to be tested here, then the question mark, then the result if true, colon, the result if false. And, and you can uh, nest these things as many deep as you want. Here is F equals not cell and ended with I0 or cell ended with I1. So basically you're just writing out the equation. Essentially cell, cell prime uh, I0 plus cell I1. Or like I said, you can do this always block. We'll talk about that uh, later. And really, we won't really spend a lot of time on this. Always blocks are pretty complicated. Uh, <clears throat> but we'll cover them briefly. All right, and here's what this would look like. Uh, well, here's the always block, uh, just so you can see. Uh, this would be a, a way to do it. And I think uh, I think this was a four to one multiplexer, actually. Yeah, you could do a two to one, obviously, too. Okay, um, so assignment statements in VHDL. You have a signal name, you have this funny construct, less than equal, which is essentially uh, an assignment. And then you have your expression, and then you have an optional delay, where you have to use the keyword after and then so many nanoseconds delay, or whatever. In Verilog, you have the keyword assign, and then you have the signal name, you have pound and a delay if you specify it, again it's optional, and then that equals, and then the expression. Both of them end with semicolons. Now, both of these assignment statements, whether in VHDL or Verilog, whenever any signal on the right-hand side of the operator, here it's, this is the equal sign, essentially. Here's the equal sign here. So whenever expression changes, these are automatically executed, just like they would be if these were inputs into, say, an AND gate. Anytime the inputs into an AND gate change, the output is changed uh, to match the change in the inputs. Might not change, but if it does change, then it's updated, obviously. These execute whenever the signal in the expression, the right-hand side, changes. Where, um, okay. There are some assignment statements in VHDL where they're executed when they're encountered in the code in a more sequential manner. All right, so here's, some, here's a VHDL module. We have modules in VHDL and we have modules in Verilog. The module is the essential building block. Just like in C, you have functions. And you, you have a main function in the case of uh, VHDL and Verilog, you have a top-level module. And then all the other modules uh, are referenced and called by that top-level module. Uh, we, do, we generally, just like in C, we do not define modules within modules. We define them separately. Just like in C, we def don't define functions within functions. We can call functions within functions, but we don't define them. And that's the same thing we do in VHDL. In VHDL, we break up the definition of a module into two pieces. 
uh, one piece called an entity and the other piece called the architecture. The entity is merely a description of the signals that can come in or go out, and the architecture describes how those signals are processed. In Verilog, we do it all in, in, one, uh, in, in one part. We don't break it into two different pieces, but we do exactly the same thing. The module name lists all the signals that are going into it, and then we describe those signals, and then we basically continue with the body of the module from there. So they're still really pretty similar, even though there's this slight difference. We usually, in, in both VHDL and in uh, Verilog, we don't use curly braces uh, for very much. We do use them for the concatenation operator in Verilog. But uh, what we, normally, uh, we normally group things using uh, begin and end statements. And um, so, so here's, a, here's, a, here's a, a, um, an example of a, of a VHDL uh, my, uh, entity, OK? So in this case, it specifies all the, all the signals in the port. So we have A, B, and whatever else. They're defined as inputs. They're bit variables. And if you want to specify initial values, you can. Uh, and then here, you have E, output, and it's a single bit as well. And then you have uh, the end of the name of the entity, whatever that is. It might be like 2-bit adder, or 4-bit adder, or multiplexer, 4-to-1 four, four multipliers, or whatever. You put the name in there. Uh, in the case of Verilog, we have the keyword module and then the name, and then we have in parentheses the input list, and then after this we specify whether they're inputs or outputs and whether they're, you know, how many bits wide they are and all that. So they're very similar. The difference is in VHDL, then to do the architecture we have a separate keyword and we start again, whereas in Verilog uh, we just continue within this uh, same module construct, and finally at the end we do end module. All right. So uh, here's an here's example in VHDL of, say, a full adder. One bit of A, one bit of B, one bit of carry in, and we're going to generate one bit of sum and one bit of carry out. So here's our port list. So we have an entity. It's called full adder. And then there's our port list. And uh, then down here, we're going to define the architecture. We could use this port list with several different architectures. Uh, so that's one little bit of difference. Uh, between this and Verilog. But here we have the architecture of full adder, so the same name, architecture of full adder is, and then here we go. And this is, uh, this is the, the name of the architecture is structure of full adder, whereas the name of, up here in the entity is just full adder. So this is structure of full adder. And then, so anyway, so then here we're saying the sum equals A and B and C exclusive or together, and the carry is a and B, or C and the result of A or B. So that, that's, that's the actual equation for the sum and the carry. And, uh, and so now then we've defined, we've defined this. Now you can instantiate it in some other module and actually use this. This is just where we defined it, but it would actually be used by instantiating it. Just like when we define a function, that's great. But if we never instantiate the function into our mainline code, then the function would never be used. And that's the same thing here. We, we then have to put it into our top level module where then it would get used. OK, so there's a, there's a lot of syn, uh, syn, syntactic considerations. Um, uh, I, I don't think that was so, yeah. So, so we have to specify the entities and the architectures. We have to declare our signals. Uh, our internal signals don't have to be declared as inputs or outputs or in-outs. They can be bidirectional. These internal signals don't have these distinctions, but all of the signals in our port list, both in Verilog and VHDL, have to have an in-out or in-out designation. And um, if we declare the signal in our entity, then when our architecture references that, we don't declare the signals again. We can just use them. But if we need additional signals within inside the the architecture, then we declare those within the architecture. Um, in our concurrent statements, the order in which we list the statements does not matter. Unlike in a normal program where, where the order is very important, it doesn't matter in VHDL or Verilog because these, these, these statements execute continuously. Whenever a right side changes, no matter where they are in some sequence, the, 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 uh, the, that, that um, assignment statement will execute.
And for the most part, VHDL is not case sensitive, and for the most part, Verilog is case sensitive. We have to decide whether our signals are bits or integers, uh, and we also have vectors and some other things. And, uh, and then uh, we also have our sequential design parts, which we haven't covered yet. All right, our, our, our signals in VHDL can take on all these nine these nine different values and I, I some of these I don't even know they're kind of confusing but but for the most part uh, we're using these uh, we only use these five types here and in and in and in Verilog we only use four of these five types so Verilog is a little simpler in that regard these are considered uh, IEEE standard logic signals U X zero one or Z so zero and one you should be familiar with that's false and true and they represent typically voltage levels. Z, you've also encountered, that's our tri-state buffer. That's when we have it disconnected or high Z. And then U and X, U is uninitialized, which means we've booted it up, but we haven't assigned uh, an initial value to the signal. And X means, for some reason, we don't know what that signal's value is. All right. But in Verilog, we only use four of these. We don't use the uninitialized. We only use X, 0, 1, and Z. All right, so that pretty much covers uh, uh, what I wanted to what I wanted to cover there. So let me expand this. And now what I'm going to do is uh, get set up, and we're going to go through the uh, uh, go through the uh, quiz that we did, the Queen and McCluskey quiz. Okay, so uh, let me go back to the uh, test. So here it is. So now, uh, so the first thing you do is you start the test and then you see that the um, you see your instructions and you see that f of a b c d equals the sum of them in terms 0 1 4 5 7 8 10 15 plus don't care is 2 and 11 so that finally tells you everything you need to know to solve the problem okay so now to to really solve it what we're going to have to do is i'm going to expand this and then i'll switch over to uh the other camera and we'll look at this and yeah okay that's hopefully pretty good maybe we'll raise this up a little bit if we can all right yeah so so basically then here's my problem zero one four five seven seven uh zero one four five seven eight ten eleven ten ten fifteen plus two and eleven don't cares now when you have don't cares as you know you do include them over here in your min terms. So I have to add in 5, 10, and 7, and 11. I already had 2 in here. So uh, the only one you really didn't know was 11. Uh, you also knew all the min terms down here because I listed all the min terms, but 11 is not listed down there because it's a don't care uh, down here. Just the essential, just not, just the min terms that are required, the actual ones in your problem. Just those are listed down there. And so, um, all right, so let's see what happens. So we basically, we go through combining. We know that 0 combines with 1, and 2, and 4, and 8, giving us 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 4, 0, 8. So that's A prime, B prime, C prime, A prime, B prime, D prime, A prime, C prime, D prime, and B prime, C prime, D prime. Those are the all possible uh, combinations because we had all of our single variable terms. Our single, our terms of what just one one, and so and so. Therefore, we used all these. Then these uh, we can combine one and five, and two and ten, four and five, and eight and ten. So we get one five two ten four five eight ten, and so we used all these, and then we can combine. Uh, uh, there is no combination of five and seven, or five and eleven. They, they differ by too many variables. Uh, and there's no combination of 10 and 7 and 10 and 11. Oh, wait, I'm, uh, let's see. 10, 11 does combine, right? Yeah, 5, 7 combines, 10, 11 combines. Uh, my bad. So we use both of these. And then all these combine with uh, 15. So you get 7, 15, and 11, 15. All right. Now, uh, now we go through and compare these. And we see which ones we used. So we could combine a 0, 1, and uh, 4, 5. 
we can combine uh, 0, 2, and uh, 8, 10. We can combine 0, 4, and 1, 5. And we can combine uh, 0, 8, and 2, 10. So we used all these, we used all these, and we got four combinations over here, but two of them are redundant. So we have two unique combinations, 0, 1, 4, 5, and 0, 2, 8, 10. And this is uh, A prime, C prime, and B prime, D prime. So that's what we got. And, uh, and so, so now these, however, none of these would combine. So we couldn't combine. None of these would combine with 5, 7, or 10, 11. So notice here we're missing a, a D. So we're missing a D and 8, 10. So can 8, 10, and 5, 7 combine? No, they differ by all three variables, so they can't combine. They can only differ by one. How about, um, how about can anything combine with uh, 10, 11? Um, well, so we have, uh, uh, so we're missing a D. We're missing a D in 4, 5. So can 4, 5 and 10, 11 combine? No, they differ by uh, all three variables, so you can't combine those. And then how about... Uh, 5, 7, and 7, 15? No, because uh, these differ. We're missing a, B, a, a C and a D here. We're missing an A and a B here, so there's no way they can combine. We have to miss the same variable. All right, so, so these don't combine, so we circle them. And now in our final chart, we have this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one, and this one. So we have six that we move to our final chart, okay? And here's our final chart down here. So we have uh, we have 0, 1, 4, 5, 0, 1, 4, 5, which you see would be uh, A prime, C prime. So we write A prime, C prime here, and 0, 1, 4, 5 there. And then the next one is uh, 0, 2, A, 10, B prime, D prime. And then we have 5, 7, which is A prime, B, D, A prime, B, D. And then we have... Uh, 10, 11, which is A, B prime, C, A, B prime, C, and then we have 7, 15, which is uh, B, C, D, and then we have 11, 15, which is A, C, D. So then we mark all of these. Now notice here, so 0, 1, 4, 5, so 0, 1, 4, 5, we mark all those. 0, 2, 8, 10, 0, there is no 2 up here because it's a don't care. So 0, 8, 10, uh, and then 5, 7, 5, 7, 10, 11. Uh, there, is no, there is a 10, but there's no 11 because it's a don't care. 7, 15, 7, 15, and 11, 15. No 11, just a 15. Now we look down each row. We find the don't cares. Only one here, only one there, only one there. So the two essential prime implicants are A prime, C prime, and B prime, D prime. Then what's, what's covered? So that's covered. These are covered. That's covered. That's covered. And that's covered. So what are we left with? We're left with 7 and 15 not covered. And then 7 and 15, so we pick the best one. Well, obviously 7 15 is going to be the best one. It covers both of them. So we pick it, and now we're done. Okay, and then we write our equation. A prime C prime plus B prime D prime plus B C D. Done. Now we go back and we look. What about the don't cares? Well, we have two don't cares, 2 and 11. So is where where does 2 show up? Well here 0, 2, 8, 10 is included so we have to make 2 a 1. So 2 is a 1 there and then uh, yeah let me fix this 2. So our final answer is A prime C prime plus B prime D prime plus B C D okay. We have two essentials these first two are essential and then we have uh, uh, 2 has to be a 1. What about 11? Well uh, of the three terms we have, 0, 1, 4, 5, 0, 2, 8, 10, and 7, 15, none of those include 11. 11 is included here and here, but neither one of these were selected. So 11 then has to be a 0. And now that's the entire problem worked out. Now, just to show that this is true, we, we can do a little K-map and check it. So when we're all said and done, we have two groups of four, the four corners, counting the don't care two, and this group of four up here. So that would be this group of two here, 
is 1. That's A prime, C prime. And this group of two, I labeled it number two, that's B prime, D prime, the four corners. Now we have these groups where we've just put two boxes together. So those are going to be three variable terms. We'll call them A, B, C, and D. Okay, little a, B, C, and D. So this is, little a is A prime, B, D, and little b is B, C, D, little c is A, C, D, and little, and little d is A, B prime, D, C. So th that's what these groups here are. And of course, that's a don't care. That's fine. We still list all these terms. And so then we see we have two, two variable terms, four, three variable terms. That's exactly the same thing we got on our prime implicate selection chart right here. Two, two variable terms, four, three variable terms. And then we selected them. We took the two essentials. And then we took the one, one of the non-essentials, 715, which covered the last two terms. And we're done. And there's our answer. A prime C prime plus B prime D prime plus B C D. All right, armed with this, now let's go do the test. All right, so I'll shrink this down a little bit. And uh, so the first question is, if you found any two variable terms, select all that are correct. Well, we found B, A prime C prime and B prime D prime, so select those. If you found any three variable terms, select all that are correct. B C D. A prime B D, A C D, and A B prime C. One of the don't care terms is min term two. For the best solution, we should take that as a zero. True or false? No, it's false. We should take it as a one. One of the don't care terms is min term 11. For the best solution, we should take that as a zero. True. Your final solution, your final simplest solution has how many terms in it? Just type in the number of terms. Well, your final finalist uh, solution is a prime C prime plus B prime D prime plus B C D. Three terms. Type in your answer three. And that's the quiz. All right. So hopefully that makes some sense. Uh, I will um, expand this back out and switch off and expand this back out again. All right, so so that covers uh, so that covers uh, working the test and also the introduction to HDL, which we'd already sort of covered partially before. Um, and uh, so be sure and uh, keep track of uh, when homework is due. Keep an eye on the syllabus, uh, and then we do have uh, presentations coming up next week. So uh, I'm going to talk about flip flops Wednesday and Friday, and that will complete all the information on test number two. So work your work your group design problems. Let me know if you're having problems. You can come to the uh, you can come to the uh, you can you, you can come to the office hours today at noon if you need to. Although there probably will be some competition with the uh, uh, with the DSD students. So what I'll probably do is I'll probably uh, send you an email and set up a, a help session for uh, design problems later in the week. Uh, so make sure you pay attention to that and get your design problems done. Uh, if you have not gotten in touch with your group, make sure you do. If, you, if your group is trying to get in touch with you and you've been resistant, you better get in touch, otherwise you're gonna get no credit. And uh, so make sure, you, uh, make sure you, you do cooperate and you do participate. And if your group says you didn't participate, you're, you're gonna get a zero on your project. So that's not going to help you, 5% or about 5% of your, your course grade. All right, so, uh, and the reason I'm sort of hardcore on that is because I know that you will learn a lot if you do it. And if you don't do it, I know you will miss that opportunity. So, of course, I want you to do it because you're going to learn. And it's going to help you on the second test. Trust me, everybody says that. All right, um, all right. I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to say, so we'll call